So glad that you're here this morning in spite of all the, the challenges and oppositions. I mean, there's always something. I mean, I think about that every weekend. There's, there's always something that could potentially pull us away, that could give us reason or, or excuse you know, not to worship. I, I hope that there's a part of you uh, that's, that not only just desires to worship, not just for what you get from the experience, uh, the music, and the, when they're powerful like you just heard, or, or even the scriptures or the, or the sermons, but, but you have a desire to, to be with God's people, you know, recognizing that we need that, that in the Christian life you can't do this thing solo. We weren't intended to do it solo. That's why the Bible describes us as members of a body, members of a family, um, a building made of living stones. That's what the church is supposed to be. So I hope that's part of it. But even more than that, just recognizing needs, because that sometimes can be a little bit self-serving. I hope as a Christian you, you, you recognize the worth of coming together as God's people and just honoring God. Um, to come together and sing and to praise and to pray and to seek Him is of great worth and God is worth our time. He's worth our honor. He's worth, worth our praise. You know, last week we were in 2 Corinthians at the end of chapter 2. And one of the verses that we heard, one of the phrases from that verse is this. 2 Corinthians 2.15 says, We are the aroma of Christ. We are the aroma of Christ. Um, for good or for bad, this is how God designed the whole gospel process to work. This is what God did to reach people. Through people like me and you, through flawed people, uh, through broken people, through our successes and through our failures, through our personalities, and sometimes through our personalities, both good and bad, um, God chooses to use us to give the aroma of Him everywhere so that people see Christ in us. And the Apostle Paul said about that reality, who, who is sufficient for these things? Who's sufficient for this? To represent Christ, to walk through this life and everything that we do, and how we handle problems, and how we handle challenges, and how we deal with pains, and how we celebrate victories, all of those things to reflect Christ. And who is who's sufficient for such a task? And you may feel like, even as you're hearing that message, you hear what I say today, I'm not, I can't, that's not me, I could never do that. I don't, I don't want anybody looking at my life trying to figure out what they should believe or how they should live. But here's what the Bible says about you. God has made you sufficient for these things. God has made you sufficient for these things. And who you are in Christ, who He says that you are, your sense of identity, and your sense of God-given purpose, not only who you are, but what you're here for, is established by Christ. And the one who's done a work in you is going to do a work through you if you will let Him, if you want that, if you want to be a person that, that God can use, and imagine this possibility, this potential this morning. Imagine that there are people in your life that are going to know God better, and they're going to know the salvation story more clearer because of you. They're going to see Him more clearly. They're going to experience Him better, know more of Him because they know you better. That's an incredible, incredible challenge. So we make it our aim. We make it our aim to be those who give off Christ, who give the aroma of Christ. And when you do, when that's your aim, I want to be the person God says that I am. And I want to do what God has called me to do and says I can do and give off Christ, the aroma of Christ. When we choose to do that, some amazing things happen. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. That God might use you to write His saving story. How good He is. How merciful He is. How powerful He is to save. That He would use you and your life to write that salvation story on someone else's life. May God use us all for that, to that end. Let's pray together this morning. Father, I pray that your word would speak to us to sort of grab our hearts and change our thinking and equip us and motivate us, inspire us with it, Father. Not just the words alone, but the power behind those words. Your Holy Spirit in us saying, you can and you will do these things for God's glory and for your good. The Holy Spirit work in us, Father. May we see these things come to pass. May it not just be ideas and concepts, but Father, may it be the reality of our lives that you use us this way. So speak to us, I pray, through this word today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I want to present a scenario for you this morning. Imagine this, something you probably all can sort of imagine. Imagine if you sign up for a college course, 
And as a professor is laying out the conditions of that course, and you have certain expectations of what this is going to entail, right? It's attendance, uh, class participation, maybe some quizzes, a few exams, and perhaps a final exam, and that's what your grade is going to be based on. But this professor is a little different, and he says, here's how we're going to grade you in this class for this semester. I'm not grading your attendance. Yes. Be no quizzes. Yeah, there'll be no tests. There will be just one final exam. All of your eggs are going to be in one basket. It's this final exam, and that's going to determine your grade. And everybody's feeling the weight of that. They're feeling the pressure of that. You mean a whole semester's worth in one exam? And then he says, but, but here's the catch. This semester, as I teach you, I want you to identify someone. I want you to find someone. And what you learn in these classes, I want you to teach that other person. Because on the day of your final exam, I don't want you to show up. I want that person that you chose and that you taught to show up. And I want them to take the exam in your place. So good luck with that. <laughs> How would that change the game for you? How would that change your approach? I mean, imagine if the call of Christ on your life is not simply for you to know it or get it, but that you would impart it, that not only would it be written on your heart and your life, not only would you be the aroma of Christ, let's take it to another level, but that your life would have such powerful impact on someone else that they bear the marks of Christ because of you. And that's the challenge that's in front of us in this text this morning. Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians 3, starting in verse 1. Paul says this, he says, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter of recommendation, written on our hearts to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such is the confidence we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. These things I'm about to share with you, uh, the challenge I'm about to lay out to you, which is simple and straightforward, I want that to be predicated on your absolute conviction that it's possible for you to do this, because the Bible says it is. God has made us qualified. You know, that was a big challenge uh, for Paul with the Corinthian church, at least for that segment of the Corinthian church that opposed him, that, that challenged him. You know, they were constantly wondering or asking, well, what are your credentials? I mean, you're not, you're not Peter. You, know, you weren't with Jesus. You weren't on the Mount of Transfiguration. You're not James. You're not John. I mean, you're not even some of the disciples that we don't even really remember their names. You're, you're none of those. Who, who are you to lay claim to this? And, and they're challenging him in this way. Okay, we need to see your credentials. Where are your letters of recommendation? Who, who can speak for you? Who can let us know who you are and what you've done and what you've accomplished and why we should listen to you? What, what makes you credible to say what you say? and to teach us this way, and to challenge us this way. And that's the idea of letters of recommendation. And what's Paul's response to that? I can give you something better than letters. I can give you something better than paper and words written with ink. What recommends me, or what commends me, where my credibility lies, is in people. You, you want to see what my life has been about? It can't be summarized in a recommendation letter. It can't be summarized with a CV or a resume. If you want to know what my life has been about, look at the people that God has put in my life. Look at the circles of people around me, the people that I know and that know me, the people that I've poured my life into and I've shared the gospel with. Look at the lives that I've impacted. You, you want to know what the measure of my life is? The measure is in people. In fact, that there is a church in Corinth that you yourselves exist, is his message back to them, that there's even a church here, validates me. Because this is what God has done through me. God has written living letters of recommendation, and you're it. 
You're my recommendation. You're my commendation. You're the letter that shows what my life has been about and how it's validated. So what's the big challenge here for me and you? Well, what does this say to us? If, if the second chapter of 2 Corinthians says that we give off Christ, we're the fragrance of Christ everywhere. Chapter 3 talks about living letters written by the hand of God and the Spirit of God and the hearts of people. What's the challenge for us? In a word, influence. Influence. That's what Paul is talking about. And that's the implicit challenge in this text for every believer. Influence. Oxford Dictionary summarizes influence like this. Influence is the capacity to have an effect on the character, development, or behavior of someone. The capacity to have an effect on the character, development, or behavior of someone. Now listen, everything I'm going to say to you this morning is going to fly in the face of a common human response that often says to people, I don't want you looking at me. I don't want anybody following my example. I just want to be left alone. Listen, if you want to know what to do or how to do it, how are you supposed to live? Listen, I'm not that guy. Don't look at me. But that's not who any Christian ought to be. No Christian should ever say or think, I'm not a role model. I'm nobody's guide to life. No one should be looking at my example as how they ought to follow Christ. In fact, every Christian... Every one of us made witnesses by the work of Christ in us because we possess Christ, because we possess the Spirit of Christ in us, because we know what God has done for us and because we're walking in a way that pleases Him and we're, we want to please Him, we desire that. Every one of us has a commission by God and a capacity given by God to do this very thing, to be people of influence. So I encourage you to write this down this morning. I have influence. He said, I don't think I do. I don't know. I don't think anybody looks at me wrong. I can't name the people. I don't know your circles of influence. But there's not a person in this room that is not influencing somebody. It might be family members. It might be extended family. It might be grandchildren. It might be the neighbor. It might be that person you do business with on a regular basis, even if it's just a person that cuts your hair every so often, or the person at the store that you talk to frequently. It might be somebody sitting in this room this morning, someone who sits in a small group with you called Sunday School or a life group. It might be somebody who just looks up to you from afar and watches and observes and considers. It might be that person at work who you already know that they don't believe what you believe or live like you live, but yet... They're considering your witness, your example, your choices, your attitude, your demeanor. You have influence. The question is, what sort? What sort? I mean, that's really the only question here. So the message this morning is not challenging you, hey, be a person of influence. Well, that would be ridiculous because you already are. The question for you this morning is, what sort of influence are you exerting? What sort of influence are you exerting? Whose life right now is a testimony of your influence? Is there anyone? Is there anyone? You know, it didn't happen this way, obviously. If the Apostle Paul had lived in our time and age today, I imagine he would, um, he would probably recoil against this mightily. But it seems like the most popular speakers, teachers, preachers of our generation have increasingly public sort of ministries. And so they're invited to preach at different places, conference, conventions, events, and they're forever on the road teaching somebody somewhere. And, and almost invariably, when you're in one of those situations, even if the vast majority of people there know exactly who you are, someone gives some sort of description when you get up to speak. You know, so-and-so is the father of six children, a grand grandfather of 84 and he's been preaching for 67 years and you know the list just goes on and you give all the accolades right here are the here are the spiritual trophies in the case how do you suppose the apostle paul would measure the spiritual successes of his life what, what would he say validated the suffering and the sacrifices made what, what would you say made it worth the time he spent in prison or the times he was nearly killed. 
are the times that he was nearly stoned to death or shipwrecked or snake bitten or, and the list goes on. What, what would have validated his life? What would he have said? This shows what my life was about. I have no doubt that it would have been the people that God used him to influence. That God used his words and his example and his constancy, his obedience, his faithfulness, his endurance, his perseverance, his life that God used as a tool in which he would write the good news of salvation on the heart of somebody else. I think that would be what he would say. So I started thinking, how can I do that? How can I be a person like that? How can I be a person of godly influence? Knowing that I've got family that look to me and others that I don't even know, and some that I do, how can you be a person of godly influence? Knowing that we have influence of some sort, how can I make sure that that influence is going to be a godly one? And when my time on earth is done, how can I have some validation of my time here? Because it won't be what I drove or where I live. It'll be the people that God used me to impact. And the same will be true of you. So how can we make sure that we've got godly influence? Can I give you a guide just based on the Apostle Paul's life of influence? Let me give you a few thoughts on that this morning. I would say the first key to godly influence is your own personal transformation. Your personal transformation. In fact, without this, you have no godly influence. I mean, you might have moral influence. You might have political influence. You might have a sort of ethical influence. I mean, there are a lot of people in, in our area, our culture, that probably share common sense of generalities when it comes to right and wrong and values and things like that. And you may be able to exert some of those sort of generic influences, but no one's personal morality, no one's positive values, no one's, no one's good choices get them into heaven. Only a transformed person by the work of Christ ever sees the face of God and all that God has in store for them. That's a person who by faith has given up on earning their way to heaven, but is fully trusted in Christ. Only a person who surrendered authority of their life to his and says, you are king of me, sees the face of God. Only a person who recognizes their own absolute sinfulness and his absolute perfections and corresponding mercy ever sees God's face and if you don't have personal transformation, you really have nothing to impart because God works in us before He works through us. He doesn't work in us first. One of the subjects of the, Apostles Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul's life that's probably least explored is the preparatory period in his life. The wilderness experience of the Apostle Paul's life where he is being trained where Jesus himself is his teacher. What validates him as an apostle is that he saw Jesus. He met Jesus on the Damascus Road. But his transformation was not instantaneous. He was taught by other believers. The deep gospel truths were imparted to him, and Jesus was his teacher. And for a period of time, God was transforming him so he was a different person. And so his life of influence wasn't just the knowledge that he had that was sort of theoretical, it wasn't just the possibilities that he knew that if he did certain things, these things could happen in his life or yours too. It was what he had experienced himself. God had changed him, and radically so, so that he didn't want what he used to want. And now he wanted things he would never have wanted before, and God changed him at the point of his desires. So personal transformation. God doing a work in you is the starting point of God doing a work through you. And by the way, just as an aside, and this is just my opinion, Paul's opinion, not Apostle Paul's opinion, that most critical area of transformation in your life, okay, so you think about this just for a moment, the believers in this room, that area of your life that God has most changed in you, that part of you that he has most grabbed and shaken up, twisted, turned, and made something different, consider very strongly that that is not the part of your life that God will use most to influence others. That part of you that he has most changed, most gripped, most delivered you from, released you from, converted you from, healed you from. Maybe that's the part that God most wants to use you as a tool for the change of others who struggle, who hurt, who've been defeated in the exact same way. So pray about that. 
Pray about that area that God has most done a work in your life because that may be the area in which he most wants to do a work through your life. So there's personal transformation. That leads to number two, which is a close relative of personal transformation. And that is modeled behavior. Modeled behavior. Now, this is a fascinating reality for me, and I don't know if you've really ever considered this. You've heard it a couple times as we've gone through Corinthians. We saw it in 1 Corinthians. The idea is, is here again in 2 Corinthians. But did you know that 11 different times the Apostle Paul writes something to the effect of, imitate me? Either he says it directly or the words are so close in meaning that this, this is what he's talking about. Here's my life. Do what I'm doing. Now, again, that may seem sort of odd or even counter intuitive for a modern Christian who we would say, no, no, people shouldn't imitate me. They should imitate Christ. Well, of course, Paul is saying, I'm the, I'm the human bridge for you. You follow me. Why? Because I am following Christ or even as I follow Christ. Eleven different times he says this. Let me hit just a few. 1 Corinthians 4, verses 14, and then in 16. In verse 14, he calls the Christians there his beloved children. He says, as children, and I as a spiritual father to you, be imitators of me. Any of us in this room who are parents recognize that reality. Oh, he acts just like you. Or when your parents tell you how your kids remind them of you. Oh, you're finally getting what you deserve. He's just like you. And like they say that with glee, right? I don't get that. Like, why, why are you happy about that? We were hoping for a different outcome this time around. Be imitators of me. Galatians 4.12, brothers, I entreat you, become as I am. That's powerful, isn't it? Become as I am? Is, is that pride, arrogance? Or is that someone who recognizes that this is who God says that you are, and God has equipped you, He has made you sufficient for this, so say it. If you're walking with Christ... If you're seeking Him with all your heart, if you're serving Him with your life and the gifts He's given you, if you're faithful in prayer and ardent in your approach to the Word, then why not say, hey, become as I am? Philippians 3.17, brothers, join in imitating me. Keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Keep your eyes on them. Have you got anybody that you can keep your eyes on? You got anybody in your life that can do that? Anybody that can exert that sort of life-on-life -life influence for you? Because if you don't, how much, how much healthier could your spiritual life and vitality be if you did? 1 Thessalonians 1.6, become imitators of us. Verse 7, 1 Thessalonians 1.7, become imitators of us. Why? So you can become an example to all the believers. So you can do what I'm doing for somebody else. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 7. You ought to imitate us, he says. Eleven times in his letters. He sets himself up as an example to follow this modeled behavior. But it's not just what he does. This is where sometimes I'm afraid we fall dreadfully short of God's intent and plan when it comes to influence. You know, we, we labor under this false notion sometimes that all we have to do is do it. You know, if, if we do it, if we, if we live right, right, if we make good choices, if we show uh, godliness, if we show humility, if we show faith, whatever it may be, whatever we think it is that would define us looking like a Christian, where we work or where we go to school or the people we're with, you know, we think if we just do it enough that it'll sort of be caught, it'll, it'll rub off on people, Right? And I don't know about you, this is an insufficient testimony I get, but I've never heard anybody say, you know, I've been watching you. You, know, you, you drive in such a godly way. You know, you're so courteous with people. I just, I'm sorry, I had to knock, knock on your window and say, you must be a Christian. Or, you know, I've watched you, how you, you, know, how you put those things together at work, those little doohickeys that you have. You, know, you just do one after another, and you're so faithful at it. You know, no one's walking up to most of us and saying, hey, I've been watching you. You know, that's, that's a, it's a myth. I mean, that validates what we're about to do next, which is about to, we're going to say something. Because if you're not saying anything, you're not influencing anyone, because what influences people the most is the truth. Now, you can invalidate your words with poor actions, but great actions don't suffice for non-existent words. Does that make sense? I, I was driving by a church the other day, and we, we were, well, it doesn't matter, um, I won't say what church it was, but I was driving by the church and I saw the sign, and it's so tired, it's so cliched, it's so inaccurate. And it said, declaring again, preach the gospel at all times, if necessary, use words. 
And it was attributed to St. Francis of Assisi, which one, he never said that, and two, had he said that, even if St. Francis would be wrong, it's inaccurate. If you're going to preach the gospel, you have to use words. And if you want to influence someone, I don't want someone simply to follow a good moral example that I set. Right? I, I don't want them to just simply be nice to their spouse or uh, kind to their animals or uh, cut their grass or whatever it may mean. I, I want to do more than set a good example. I want people to know who Jesus is, the real Jesus. I want people to know what the Bible says about life and everlasting life and, and what they can build their hope on. And the only way that's going to happen is if you teach the Bible. Biblical teaching is necessary for godly influence. Now, I didn't plan this, but let me take this as an opportunity to give you a commercial for a second. Tonight we're showing a film. Some of you may have seen it. It's been available for uh, several months now on Amazon Prime, I think uh, maybe on Apple. Um, a group put together a film called um, American Gospel. American Gospel. Subtitle is Christ Alone. And this film does a fantastic job of exploring how in so many ways the modern American church has gotten it wrong. How we have replaced the biblical gospel with this sort of cultural Christianity that's very vague and very nebulous and in many ways either Christ-less or presenting a Christ that's far less than who the Bible says he is. You know, we have this idea sometimes that's, oh, you know, everybody around me, they're all Christian. Everybody knows. No, no. They know the terms. Okay? They know the terminology. And they may even say, well, I'm Christian. But often in our culture, that simply means I'm Christian because I'm not an atheist. And I'm not a Muslim. I'm not a Buddhist. I'm not, I'm not Hindu. I mean, what else would I be? It doesn't mean they know the Christ of the Bible. It doesn't mean that they know what the gospel says. It doesn't mean that they know what it means to follow Christ or that they are following Christ. And so for that to have, have that kind of influence, we need biblical teaching. As Paul often said, we preach Christ. We preach Christ. Th this is what we do. His influence. You know, if I were to ask you, how did Paul influence the Christians in his sphere, whether it was Corinth or Philippi or Thessaloniki or whatever it may be, your first thought may have run to, well, he was a teacher par excellence. I mean, he, he, here's the teacher, writer, and that's true. But that was validated by his life, and those two things went hand in hand. That's why he would tell his protege, Timothy, he said to Timothy, watch your life and your doctrine closely. Watch them closely, both of them. Later, he tells Timothy, preach the word. Preach the word. This is your ministry. Preach the word. In season and out of season. You preach the Word. And that's predicated on, I've carefully watched my doctrine, so when I stand up to speak, or in your case, when you sit down to teach, or open up your Bible to explain, or have a conversation, you're teaching the truth. But your truth that you're conveying is validated by a life that says, I don't just know this, I do this. This is not just what I understand, this is who I am. This is what we're talking about. And that's what brings us to number four. That's what gives your life moral authority. You want to be a person of spiritual influence, of godly influence? If the goal of your influence is to have an effect on the character, de development, or behavior of someone, then you've got to have the moral authority to do it. Because the response of someone who thinks you don't is going to be something like this. Well, who are you to tell me what to do? Oh, oh, really? You're going to try to tell me how to and then fill in the blank? Oh, you're one to talk. Oh, really? Coming from you. That's rich. Right? And this is what we hear. When we hear that, what they're saying is, you lack the moral authority to speak to my life, so zip it. I read one old quote this week that says this, the reason why the world knows God so poorly is because it knows us so well. We've got to have the moral authority to speak, and that moral authority is based on this simple question, am I doing what I'm saying? Am I doing what I'm saying? One of the big accusations I guess the world frequently makes is, against Christians, I mean, is hypocrisy, right? Oh, I, don't, I don't want to go to church, there's a bunch of hypocrites there. And, and sometimes that is true. Now, people measure hypocrisy differently. 
Um, sometimes what they mean is, well, the people there struggle like I do. And if that's what they mean, then yes, you're right. I mean, we do. We have the same issues and struggles and temptations and weights and pressures and challenges and all those things. We find our strength in Christ. We find our redemption and restoration in Christ. We, we find our ability in the Spirit of Christ in us. We find our guidance in the Word of Christ given to us. And, and when we fail, we find Him rich in mercy and willing to forgive. But are we different essentially in what we face? No. Should we be different in how we respond to what we face? Yes. But if by hypocrisy they mean this, oh, I know a lot of people who say one thing and do another, well, that one kind of hits between the eyes. When they know what we say when we sing or go to church or give our Sunday school answers, but they also know us well enough to know what we do, well, that's a different story altogether. And that sort of hypocrisy is devastating. Am I doing what I'm saying? Paul said to the Philippians, Philippians 4, 9, what you have learned and received, what you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Catch that again because you're going to want to look that verse up later, I know. Philippians 4, 9, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. That's moral authority. And I'm not speaking down to you. I'm not challenging you to do something that I don't do. If a person has moral authority, you're sitting there face to face with somebody you care about, someone that you love, someone that you have been granted the opportunity to speak into their life and saying, listen, this is what I'm doing. This is what God has shown me. And this is my response. And of course, all of those things, those four things, they all happen in the context of intentional relationships. Intentional relationships. You, you want to be a person of influence? You want to be somebody that God is using to write His story on their hearts, on their lives? And you've got to be very intentional about being in relationships with people. You've got to seek them out. You've got to get close to people. You've got to invite people into your life. You, you've got to be there. You've got to get face to face. You can't be too busy. You can't be too self-absorbed. You can't be too disconnected. You say, but, I, but I'm an introvert. Okay. There were different personality types among the apostles too, but they all had the same calling. Our calling and our responsibility is not based on personality types. But that God would use us to get up close with people. You've probably heard the saying, you can impress people from far away, but you can only influence them from up close. Your life might be impressive to someone. They might have an image of you that's gilded. Oh, I wish I could be like them. They're so... But you'll not have real impact on their life, what I would call influence, unless they know you up close. Unless they really hear how you talk and see what you think. And how do you respond to difficulty? And how do you pray? And how do you handle temptation? What do you like when life squeezes you hard? What do you life like when the pressure of stuff is all around you? That's intentional influence. Of course, what's the goal of all this? The goal is not just to make people like you or to make people who are like you. The goal of this influence that we're talking about here is this new covenant with Christ. Christ and the new covenant. That's the goal. Christ and the new covenant. That's what he's talking about here. I mean, again, look, look what he says at the end of the passage there that we read just a moment ago. Verse 5, he says, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us. I don't, I don't claim credit for this. I don't want to be a hindrance in somebody else's life. But I don't claim credit for the change in their life. But I do want to be a tool, an instrument that God would use. Our sufficiency is from God. Who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant? Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Let me point out a couple things there, and I'm going to be out of time, and, and I want you to hear this. One, Paul is not just talking about himself, so you don't just read what I'm saying and saying, hey, listen, that's all well and good, but, but I'm not the Apostle Paul. I'm not an apostle, not a preacher, not any of those things. Sorry, fail, doesn't apply. Paul's speaking to the entire body of believers there, and he calls them us, he says we, and he defines them as ministers. 
because we all have the potential made so by God, because this is what God did in your life if you're a Christian, and this is what you can impart, what you can give away because you're a Christian and Christ spirits in you. It's the new covenant. And he phrases it this way. He says the old covenant, he, he called that the letter. He said that kills, but the spirit gives life. Now don't misinterpret that as some of our wacky um, modern day uh, storefront churches tend to do with this and say, oh, you know, that's, we don't have to follow any laws anymore. There, there's no laws. We're totally free. No, no, that's, there's a term for that. It's called antinomianism. You'll actually hear some of that tonight in the, in the film. No, he's not talking about, no, you don't have to do anything anymore. He says, here's an old law. The old law, the old covenant says this, do these things and you shall live. Don't do these things and you shall die. And when you take this insurmountable covenant, the old covenant, the covenant of law, and you realize I cannot meet it. It's too high, too wide, too deep. I fail it at some point. I fail it in many points. In fact, the scripture says, actually, if you fail it in one point, you failed it in every point. And what is the effect of failing God's moral law? Death. Death. He says, this brings death. He said, let me share with you what brings life. There's a new covenant that brings life. It's the covenant that Jesus came in the world to bring. The new covenant with God is this. What you cannot do, Jesus says, I have done. Where you have failed, I have succeeded. I have kept every part of the law. I have fulfilled it all. I am your sacrifice. I'm your substitute. I'm your stand-in. The new covenant we have is not that I stand before God based on the works of my life, which leads to death, because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The new covenant we have is Christ stands before God in my stead as one who is sinless and perfect and who paid the price for all of my sins. And when I get accepted by the Father into heaven, I get accepted because of Christ. He is my salvation. That's the new covenant. He says, and this is what we're ministers of. I mean, consider this new covenant just for a moment. It's life instead of death. Work all your life at being the best person you can be, only to stand before a perfect and holy God and say, but you weren't Christ. But you didn't keep all the parts of the law. And then you fail utterly. That's death. From a law that is oft broken by me and you. How often have we broken the laws of God? To a covenant that's unbreakable because Christ is perfect. Tempted in every way like we are, but He never sins. From an old law that we look at externally, it's behavior modification, it's, it's compliance, it's, it's external to us, and we try and we struggle to a law that's written on our hearts. That's the work of the gospel in us, not freeing us from having to do certain things, but now God has written his moral code on our hearts. What does that mean, by the way? When he says the, the new law is written on our hearts, does that mean we just know them intrinsically or internally and we don't have to look them up anymore because they're written here versus written here? Is it just a different place to read them? No, that's not what he's talking about. When he says it's written on your heart, what he's talking about is it changes us at the point of desire. You see, before I became a Christian, trying to act like a Christian was external to me. I'll try not to cuss anymore. I'll, I'll, I'll try not to be angry anymore. I'll, I'll, I'll try to stop being whatever anymore. It's external to me. Till when Christ saves us, he writes a different law in our hearts. Now all of a sudden, I don't want to be this way anymore. It doesn't mean we don't fail sometimes. It doesn't mean the tug and pull of the old life is not sometimes strong. But the desires are different because God's law is written in our hearts. It's not behavior modification. It's heart transformation. And what's the result of all this? It is to know God. And it is to be forever forgiven. That's the aim of influence. Anything less than that as a Christian falls short of what God wants to use your life for, that you could be the instrument in someone's life by which they would know God and be forgiven forever. So I just want you to think about this for a moment. I'm going to close. I went longer than I intended, but I want you to hear this. I can't imagine any uh, richer reward than that God would use your life, use my life, in such a way that someone comes to know God through Christ. And is forever forgiven. And well, what's, the, what's the letter of recommendation for your life? What's your lifetime resume? Do you want it to be written on, on paper? Or do you want it to be written on hearts? Do you want it to be accomplishments that die with you? 
Or do you want it to be people who forever enjoy eternity with you? Which will it be? I pray that God would use you and that God would use me to be people of influence, that they might know Christ. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8 says this, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. That's the law that He gave them upon that event. For they did not continue in my covenant, and so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds, I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least to the greatest, for I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. And speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Listen, we live in that age. We live in the age of the new covenant. It's a covenant of mercy and grace. Whoever you are and whatever you've done, Christ can forgive you and establish a lifelong covenant with you. No, no, more than lifelong. Everlasting, lifelong. That you may know Christ that you may see His love and goodness and mercy and enjoy Him forever. That's the aim. Let's pray together. It's all over this room. And I want you to pray about that if you're a Christian. Not just the idea in general of being a person of godly influence. I mean, start there. And I pray that somehow in your prayer time, it will go beyond that to the specifics. God, who? Who right now? Who in this circle of influence might I exert godly influence over? Who are you praying for right now that they would know Christ, that they would have their sins forgiven forever? Who? Who is that for you? Man, I pray that you would want it, you would desire it, and that God would use you for it. And listen, you say you can't, you're not. Listen, you can. Because God has made you able. Do you begin to pray about that right now, that God would use you? Who's that one person? Or more. But who's that person that God would use you that, man, I, I, I want to be, I want to be the tip of of the quill of the pen that God uses. The point of the pen that God uses to write His story on somebody's life. Who is it for you? If you're not a Christian yet, you've been listening to these words today. There are only two covenants. There's a covenant of works and there's a covenant of grace. There's a covenant of law and the covenant of spirit, okay? Either it's by your works. And the Bible says, through our righteousness, no one's going to see God. No one will see God based on their own righteousness. The old covenant will fail you. But the new covenant, the new covenant will free you. Free you to be who God made you to be. Free you from your sins. Free you from the punishment for them and the power they had over you. But you've got to come to Christ. You've got you to humble yourself. You've got to say, I need forgiving. You've got to say, I am a sinner and I see that God is a Savior through Jesus who died on the cross for me. And he rose again to redeem me and buy me back. I, I, you got to come to him. In just a moment, we're going to have a time response. I encourage believers, if God's putting someone in your heart, come and pray for them. And come and pray about how God will use you. That he would open up these avenues of influence. And if you're not a believer yet, come and speak to one of our pastors that are standing here. And let's tell you how today, this very day, you can know God. Your sins can be forgiven. And you can have his promise over you forever. Will you do that? Let's, let's pray. Father, move our hearts to respond to you in obedience. May what we do right now, uh, may it please you. May it honor you. Father, set some free today. Save some today. Father, send some out today ready, ready to represent you well, to be the aroma of Christ. Father, I pray you do that even now. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Listen, would you stand? Is, is the music just going to play quietly for a few moments? If you want to pray, come and find a place to pray. You do that. If you're not sure of where you stand with Christ, be sure of that right now. As the music plays, I'm not going to sing yet. Just think of what, of what God would have us to do for a moment. What should our response to this be today? What does God want us going out here doing, not just thinking?
Father, I pray you'd make us people of, of, of godly influence. Um, Father, you've given us the opportunities. None can deny that. We've got people around us. Uh, we're not islands. And uh, Father, use us. Uh, Father, not just example, but I pray that. I pray we'd be people of godly example. But of sound biblical words. And Father, may we enjoy that. May, may we receive the blessing of that. May we have the everlasting reward of that, of being used by you to write a new story on someone's heart, uh, a new future, a new eternity, because we introduced them to Jesus, because we told them what the gospel is and how to follow him, and we showed them. Uh, Father, use us to that end. Um, I pray there be many living letters written because of the people in this room, many. Let that be our commendation. Uh, Father, that's my prayer today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to do something a little different before you go today. Some of you might be thinking, wait, I thought today was like a religious holiday of some sort. Isn't this like Palm Sunday? I remember as kids coming to church um, on Palm Sunday, we had to, like these big branches and stuff, and they'd be waving them and swinging them. And I remember we did different things. I didn't know exactly what it was for. I think there was a donkey there one year, but I don't remember all the details. Here's the interesting part of the, of the Palm Sunday event. Palm Sunday begins for us as Christians what we call Holy Week. Right, the final week of the, of the life of Christ. And here's something that, that, that struck me about that first Palm Sunday, and I'm sure you realize this too. You know, on Palm Sunday, you have the people shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. It, it looks like worship, right? It looks like worship. If you read Matthew chapter 21, and he's riding in just as the prophecy pro, uh, proclaims that he will. He's coming in on a donkey, and the people are shouting and singing and praising, and they're waving the, the palm fronds. And it's very interesting, at the end of that passage, someone asks the question, well, maybe it's the guy, you know, that can't quite see over the crowd in the parade, or whoever it may be, and he asks this question, well, you know, who is this? Who, who, are, we, who are we doing this for? Who's the, who's the focal point of the event here? And the answer that we see recorded in Matthew's gospel is this, he says, this is Jesus, he's the prophet from Nazareth. And that tells us some profound things there. One, you can't worship that which you don't know. And your worship is going to be insufficient at best when you don't know who Christ is. And they yet did not know Christ as the saving Messiah who would take away the sins of the world based on his sacrifice and resurrection. They were still looking for something else. And that's why a week later, the people of Jerusalem would be complicit in his death, in his murder, in his crucifixion. Crucify him, crucify him. And they didn't understand, they didn't see. It, it dawned on me as Christians, while it's important for us to recognize the beginning of this and Jesus coming into the city intentionally, purposefully to surrender his life for our sins, that we as Christians recognize Palm Sunday a little bit differently. That is to say, on that day, people gathered around Jesus, but they didn't yet know who he was, so they could not worship him as the King of kings and Lord of lords. They couldn't. They didn't. But we can and we do. We do. Our Palm Sunday is different because when we declare Jesus, we know who we celebrate. We know what he accomplished, and we know that he's coming again for us. And so our celebration ought to be a little bit different. Do you agree? So we're going to, you got to agree more than that because this is going to take a little bit more energy. Um, we're going to sing a song together. We're going to sing a song they could not have sung on the first Palm Sunday because they didn't know it. They didn't see it. They didn't have it. But let's give Jesus Christ the honor that is due his name as we recognize what he's done for us, as we sing this song together. Let's sing and praise him and give Jesus the Palm Sunday celebration he deserves.
Then I shall bow. 